why can't the TSX get a fair shot this uh, this quarter? Well, there's a few reasons. I mean, in the big macro story in Canada, you've got really tepid productivity growth, and you've got a de debt profile that's pretty unsavory, both household and credit corporate. So in an era of more tighter financial conditions, that's a real headwind. There are pockets of the TSX that look interesting, particularly the materials side. We're just playing that through direct commodity exposure. And so our thought is, I don't think the TSX is not like a go and sell everything. We just think you can earn more return outside, particularly in the U.S. market and Japan. And, Japan. and you have the third tailwind that if you do have a bit of a slowdown, we would expect the Canadian dollar to, to, to underperform kind of the majors. And so you got the kicker of currency as well. It has, it has lagged, wouldn't you say? The Canadian dollar, considering oil has moved up so significantly, the Canadian dollar is not kept pace. Yeah, that relationship the last few years has really kind of broken down. Even though it's still our, main, our largest export, the way the market looks at the Canadian dollar now, it just doesn't trade it as an oil proxy like it would the Norwegian crone for example so mainly a rate differential story rate differential productivity story um, kindness to foreign capital story in terms of major investment all these things have kind of gone against Canada recently it's interesting to hear you mention productivity as an investment thesis because we hear it talked about a lot as a policy problem economists talk about it a lot talk to me about productivity using your investor hat yeah so first off Productivity, arguably, up, up with inflation is probably one of the most misunderstood. People talk about it, but really when you see it, you know what it is. It's really about you know building things that make our standards of living higher. And typically that's done through the corporate sector, through goods and services. And so when corporations de develop things that make our lives better and they make money at it, that's a, a form of productivity. Um, we just haven't been very good at it. And on a per capita basis, we've been horrible at it. And that's a factor of not really understanding where productivity comes from. It comes from private sector typically not the public sector so that's been a real problem for Canada I think it's starting to more and more people are talking about it it is you know our standard of living will stagnate if we don't see an improvement in productivity if you look at the TSX there's not a lot of technology stocks uh, creating kind of new types of, 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 of products if you will uh, it's typically older economy stocks and, and that's uh, led to the uh, you know Canadian the Canadian economy has performed okay but it's really been population growth it hasn't been that that real real growth which was, was driven by productivity. well that's what I was going to say you, that, that's why you don't get those tech shot stocks showing up um, on on the TSX and so is part of your thinking around Japan as well because they have you know also that innovation piece that tech piece so I've been managing money for 25 years never really looked at Japan okay. and I think I would be in the majority it has been a real afterthought because it's been there's been a 30-year deleveraging after their major property bust in the late 80s um, but I think Japan is interesting it is emerging from deflation it actually is starting to see prices increasing the Bank of Japan just recently lifted rates above zero and they're starting to see this virtuous cycle of wage gain price gain and ultimately rate hike gain still very accommodated a policy as well as on the on the corporate governance side there's been huge improvements through companies divesting one another. So now you have a real stock market with proper corporate governance. So all those things plus very cheap valuations makes it an interesting place to, to look at. So since you look at policy with your your investment hat, you know, what about something like demographics? That doesn't favor, you know, high growth, I guess. Yeah, I mean, demographics is one of those things that it can be a little confusing because just because you have a younger population doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a great place to invest. It's all about what those people do. Are they able to go and work and live and, and, and produce? And so J Japan's productivity challenge has been, has had, there has been an issue with demographics. What's interesting now is that those, the, the share of the population over 50 is declining at a very rapid rate. So they are going to have workforce shortages um, very soon. And that ultimately will lead to more productivity because they're going to have to automate far faster than other hmm. geographies. And so, ironically, their challenging demographic profile actually will lead to a boon of investment just for basic services, if you will. Another reason to, to look at Japan. It sounds like you're structurally inclined to look at tech. Um, so does that mean the U.S. kind of screens very favorably? Um, and, and if so, maybe I'll ask a follow-up, which is, is it too much? Is it too concentrated? So the, the most profitable well-run companies in the world reside in the U.S. market, full stop. It is expensive. Um, and so for our perspective, it's you have to be there, but we are looking for other places to diversify that risk, if you will, and that's ultimately the way we're, why we're looking at other, our other jurisdictions. Um, going into this period right now, look, there's a lot of ways that we can go from here, and one of them is where you see a bit of a melt-up or even a, a bubble, if you will, 
in tech, anything related to AI is really running right now. And so you certainly want to earn a return during that period of time, but being, being mindful to have kind of one foot off the dance floor, if you will, in terms of not being there too long. Because if it does go into a more of a mania, like the late 90s, it can be quite problematic for years afterwards. So tech exposure outside of the US, where would you find that? Yeah, well, certainly Japan, yeah. Europe. Uh, those Europe? Pretty, you want to talk about regulation around tech? Well, the, Europe has a lot of regulation. We look at a company like uh, you know companies like ASML, um, where you know global champion and fab yeah. and creating fab. So there are pockets where there's interesting spots. But um, and, and quite frankly, we're probably becoming more restrictive. Europe's I think after what's happened recently with with conflicts with with on Eastern Europe, are starting to realize that they can't overregulate their economy. They have to start thinking a bit more broadly because they just don't have the luxury of, of waiting anymore. You talked um, commodity exposure um, and your preference to get it um, through the commodities themselves versus uh, equities that cover them. Are you bullish generally on, on the commodity boom that we've seen recently? So we were structurally bullish, not just you know, cyclically. We've had a, a bit of a run last mm -hmm. few weeks, but we're structurally bullish because we believe we're going to see shortages across the commodity complex in the years to come. As particularly Western countries start to look at, at infrastructure rebuilds, there's just not enough copper, uh, there's just not enough lithium, if you will, to build EVs. Um, and so there's going to be, and we haven't, we're just not bringing on supply nearly quickly enough. Um, so we think that we're going to be into periods of shortages within commodities. You can play it through companies, although you've got the operating risk as well as the financing and, and, and also uh, geopolitical risk in terms of, of seizing assets, whereas playing it directly to the commodity market is just a cleaner way to get that exposure without having the headache of operational risk. Looking right now, I would say the, 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 the commodity, commodities have actually run quite quicker, faster than the stocks. So from a tactical basis, you, you might want to look at companies, but from more of a strategic viewpoint, we just like the pure play of the, of the outright commodity exposure. What do you tell your clients about Bitcoin, if anything? So we're in the business of managing people's wealth. And um, when we invest in things, we're looking for returns, whether it's income, dividend, or growth. You know, when you're buying assets such as Bitcoin, you, you're buying it on the hopes that someone else is going to pay you more for that asset down the way. You know, if speculating is fine, but from our perspective, uh, I can't look our clients in the eyes and explain to them why, why that might go down 50%, which it may well happen because I just don't really understand, um, you know, why why people buy it or sell it to begin with. So we we tend to stay away from crypto. If we were to go we look at gold, perhaps as an alternative, um, which is actually quite interesting right now because of the diversification out of fiat into gold, primarily amongst many central central banks. I think if you're looking for that story, I think gold's far more interesting than, than is, crypto. Is it generational, though? Like, I just wonder if the younger generation, if they can buy Bitcoin now. Do they know how to buy a, you know, a brick of gold? Does it have uh, that same significance? It might not have that appeal that perhaps one might have. But ultimately, people are just reacting to the price. Yeah. And I would argue that. You know, in terms of time on their side, you know, gold's been around for 5,000 years. Uh, I'll, I'll play that, then the more, no, no more newer, uh, newer tech. All right, Michael, thanks so much for joining me. We appre I appreciate your time and your insights. That's Michael Craig joining us from TD 